Great. Well, thank you very much for, for coming to the, the hot tent, uh, everybody, in the, uh, in the heat of the afternoon. Uh, my name is Joe Jarvis. I'm a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a research associate at the Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute Partnership. And I've spent uh, most of the last 15 years running research studies on, on HIV-associated cryptococcal meningitis with many of, many of the colleagues in this room. So the session today is about implementing and delivering the new World Health Organization recommendations on treatment for HIV-associated crypt cryptococcal meningitis, which were introduced last year. Uh, we're going to have three presentations and then hopefully time for a question and answer session at the end. Um, so I will introduce the panel and quickly what we're going to be talking about. So first, we've got Professor Ratian Blovu, um, who's the Share CM Zimbabwe lead and Ambition Studies Zimbabwe principal investigator at the University of Zimbabwe. Uh, Prof. Lovu is an associate professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at the University of Zimbabwe. Her areas of interest include HIV medicine, nephrology, and the essential medicines concept. She's the current chairperson of the National Medicines and Therapeutics Policy Advisory Committee, whose main responsibility is the review of the Zimbabwe Essential Medicines List and National Standard Treatment Guidelines, plus the ART guidelines. Um, as I said, she was the Zimbabwe site PI for the Ambition CM project here in Harare, Zimbabwe. Uh, Ratti is going to be giving us an overview of the Ambition CM study. Then we'll hear from Dr. Eltas Narenda Ziwani, who's the Share CM and Imprint Lead Doctor at the Malawi Liverpool Welcome Clinical Research Program. Uh, Dr. Ziwani is the project coordinator for the Share CM project in Malawi, an internal medicine consultant at the Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Malawi, including the Umdozi Center of Excellence in HIV Care at the hospital. Uh, she's also a member of the Advanced HIV Disease Technical Working Group at the Ministry of Health and passionate about improving prevention, screening and management of AHD. And she'll be giving us a, a masterclass really in managing cryptococcal meningitis. And then last but by no means least is uh, Mr. Kennedy Mupele. Kennedy's the community engagement lead for our HIV, uh, our group on HIV associated fungal infections called Imprint with a dedicated over 18 year journey as an HIV activist and community educator. Uh, Kennedy's been an active advocate of community treatment and research literacy education, emphasizing community rooted advocacy solutions, collaborated with many renowned organizations such as AVAC, Prevention Access Campaign, uh, passionately advocating for access to treatment and educating communities on basic HIV science. Kennedy will chair the CSO Cryptococcal Meningitis webinar, bridging the gap between implementation and grassroots advocacy, and talk to us about the CSO role uh, in, in this response. So uh, over to you, Ratty. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am... We can hear you. I just, I'm just trying to see if the slides, or am I moving them? Oh dear. Okay, as we've had, I'm going to give us an overview of how we ended up with what we call the Ambition CM Regimen for the Treatment of Cryptococcal Meningitis. This is the outline of my talk. Um, I think I'm talking to the converted here. Yeah, we all know how much um, cryptococcal meningitis contributes to the mortality in HIV-related disease, uh, together with TB and severe bacterial infections. And again, I think we are all aware that despite the fact that we have effective antiretroviral therapy, we still seem to be seeing a lot of uh, cryptococcal meningitis in particular in, in Africa and Southeast Asia. Whereas in the high income countries, uh, once the antiretroviral therapies that were effective came on board, the, the incidence of cryptococcal meningitis literally dropped. So it's not really their problem, it's our problem. In terms of treatment, cryptococcal meningitis is fatal if not treated. Uh, this particular slide, we haven't actually even included the fact that the standard of care involved the use of amphotericin B deoxycholate with flucytosin. 
and the this were that the standard of care was based on um, um, a study that was done in 1997. But since then, we've had um, oral fluconazole being donated to our countries and was being used for the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. But the mortality has been dismal, 70% at 10 weeks. And nowadays, we still find that some countries are still using um, monotherapy, fluconazole monotherapy, because the amphotericin B and certainly the flucytosin had not been registered in most of our countries. So we're using amphotericin B and fluconazole at the best of times. But we know amphotericin B has, um, is quite toxic, so it, it does give us severe adverse events, and those adverse events require monitoring with lab support, which our countries might not have. The side effects, uh, like I said, you know, they are basically, some of them you can see, the thrombophlebitis and the sepsis, but the anemia, um, renal impairment, and the loss of potassium and magnesium requires lab support. So there was need to have simpler um, treatments for cryptococcal meningitis. And based on the use of single high dose for visceral leishmaniasis, we then as ambition thought we should try and consider use giving single high dose amphotericin B, the liposomal form to people with cryptococcal meningitis. It had been shown to have an excellent tissue half-life as well as being less nephrotoxic. So George Javis here then led a um, phase two study that had four arms and that's oh, it's going to oh, what have we done now sorry this is where i should have started uh, had uh, conducted a phase two trial using high dose liposomal amphotericin b i think for a change i'm actually going to use the word ambisom i usually don't like using trade names but we had access to preferentially priced uh, ambisom from uh, Gilead Sciences. So this study was conducted showing, looking at using high doses of liposomal amphotericin B compared to the then standard of care, which people are, have been using, which is basically using ambisom together with uh, fluconazole, a high dose fluconazole. But there had been no studies actually showing that you could just move from um, uh, amphotericin B deoxycholate to using um, ambisom. So this study just showed that using a single high dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram of liposomal amphotericin B was non-inferior to adding another dose of liposomal amphotericin B uh, in, in the, uh, or adding a third dose and uh, mortality was much better than what the, the standard of care was actually provided. Oh, I think this was not a good idea. Maybe I should have just been going next slide, next slide. So after the phase two uh, trial with uh, single high dose amphotericin B, the study was actually terminated early because it was shown to be um, efficacious using this single high dose of amphotericin B. Then we then went on to do the phase three trial. But before we did that, we, we then had the ACTA trial, which was uh, published in 2018. In the ACTA trial, they actually showed that using a shorter course of amphotericin B, deoxycholate at one week with flucytosin resulted in, in a much improved mortality compared to the standard of care, which was the two weeks of amphotericin B deoxycholate. They, they, they had also used um, the uh, show, fluconazole there. So you had two weeks of amphotericin B with either flucytosin or fluconazole, or one week of amphotericin B with flucytosin or, 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 or fluconazole plus an oral arm 
of fluconazole with flucytosin. And as you can see there, the mortality with one week of um, amphotericin B deoxycholate and flucytosin was much lower than the other arms. And based on these results, WHO then endorsed this induction therapy for, um, for, for cryptococcal meningitis treatment. So when we were the, the, the phase three trial, which was um, the use of single high dose liposomal amphotericin B, 10 milligrams per kilo, we were basing that on the, um, the fact that now the ACTA trial had come out showing that one week of amphotericin B deoxycholate with flucytosin was actually now the standard of care. So our study, the, the ambition trial, compared the high dose, single dose of uh, amphotericin B, the liposomal form, traveling with flucytosin and fluconazole for 14 days. That was compared to the then standard of care, which was that one week of um, amphotericin B deoxycholate with flucytosin followed by fluconazole. And basically, the, the, the study showed that uh, the single high dose liposomal amphotericin B was effective and was safer. Certainly, it was certainly much safer in terms, if you look, for instance, at severe anemia, we had about 40% adverse events in the control arm and only about 13% um, in the ambisome arm. And there was less need for um, use of uh, blood transfusion. So, and then in terms of mortality at 10 weeks, it was just 24.7% in the ambisome arm compared to 29% in the standard of care arm. And the results of this study, the phase three ambition trial came out in March, 2022. And within a month of that, WHO had issued a rapid advice endorsing the ambition induction therapy and uh, countries within the region started using this um, combination. And these are the updated WHO guidelines that are in place right now for induction therapy. And I'll just show you that the 24.8% mortality for the ambition study was the lowest in terms of mortality. Um, then you can see the mortality is quite high for the, is much higher for the other the, um, therapies. We also conducted a cost effectiveness study. We showed that the study was, um, the, 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 the regimen was actually um, cost effective and we would like to think that over time when we have less costly uh, medicines like the flucytosin and the liposomal amphotericin B, the cost in, will actually go down and the fact that we are using a single high dose and unlike what was the pertaining in the past where you had to use the medicines for one week or up to uh, 14 days, there will be less in 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 real terms, in real in the real world setting, it will be cheaper to use this combination. In summary, the ambition same regimen was shown to be efficacious and much cheaper than what was happening at the time. But the mortality, although it's much lower, just under 25 percent, it still remains high. We would like to have more affordable liposomal amphotericin B and flucytosin, as well as doing more research to as we implement this regimen. That's why we have the share CM where we are actually training healthcare workers in the use of this medicine. And then we hope that the lessons learned from what we have done will be used in, to inform the treatment of other fungal infections. I've sort of uh, whizzed through the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis because I have, we have a colleague who's going to speak to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rati, sir. Eltas.
Um, good afternoon. Um, before I start, uh, can I see a show of hands? Um, how many people are familiar with the management of cryptococcal meningitis? Ah, okay. So quite a good number. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, that makes my presentation a bit easier, I think. Um, so this will be the outline of my uh, presentation. Yeah. Um, so cryptococcal disease um, will usually um, affect people who are immunosuppressed. And in our setting, that would be um, HIV-positive individuals who um, are not virally suppressed, so fellow CD4 count, either um, ART naive or who are not um, virally suppressed on ART. Um, the infection usually is contracted by you know, spores in the environment and um, um, it is the, palm, uh, the lungs that are affected and then you develop um, um, antigenemia. So at, at the beginning of the spectrum of infection is that you can have asymptomatic cryptococcal antigenemia and then that progresses to subclinical cryptococcal meningitis and then overt clinical cryptococcal meningitis. Um, cryptococcal disease um, presents, um, can have meningeal manifestations as well as um, um, non-meningeal manifestations. So the non-meningeal manifestations um, typically, you know, fever, chills, um, weight loss, cough, as well as skin um, um, manifestations. And um, for the um, uh, meningeal manifestations, the most common uh, symptom would be a headache. And some page about 40% will have confusion, and some will have behavior change. Some will uh, present with uh, seizures. Um, uh, so, so signs of raised the cranial pressure. They'll have double vision, vision loss, even uh, hearing loss. Um, and then on examination, um, patient might have um, um, you know, symptoms, uh, signs of immunosuppression, okay? And uh, they can present with seizures mentioned, uh, they can have uh, neck stiffness, they can even present with cranial nerve uh, pulses and overt um, papillary edema on fondoscopy. Um, so it's important to remember that cryptococcal uh, disease is actually an AIDS-defining condition. So if you do suspect that the patient has cryptococcal disease, one of the tests that you'd like to do would be an HIV test, okay, and as well as a CD4 count. Um, um, okay, routine bloods are also important, a full blood count, uh, uh, renal function, liver function. Um, a lumbar puncture is very, very um, uh, essential. And um, in settings where the resources are available, you can also uh, perform a CT scan, especially if there are focal, uh, uh, focal, uh, focal, focal lateralizing signs, maybe to exclude other uh, causes of the symptoms. However, in most settings, uh, CT scans are not available. If there is a very high clinical suspicion for cryptococcal meningitis, there is no need to actually... Um, avoid doing a lumbar puncture because you, you feel like you need to do a CT scan first. You can still go ahead to do a lumbar puncture uh, in that situation. So a lumbar puncture, um, is everybody familiar with what a lumbar puncture is? Anyone who's not aware of what a lumbar puncture is? Okay, so a lumbar puncture basically is a test where we, which we use to uh, test for meningitis. Doesn't matter whether it's cryptococcal meningitis. So put a needle at the base, uh, at, at the lower back, and uh, um, the needle. When we put a we put a needle there, and we're able to withdraw fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. So this is a fluid that sort of like covers the brain and the spinal cord, and that's where we find uh, sign, uh, we, we are able to test for uh, meningitis. Um, so. Typically, in, in patients with um, cryptococcal meningitis, they'll have a high opening pressure. So the pressure of that fluid is very high, and that's what you could see. Um, you can have pressure as high as or more than 30 centimeters of water, and that um, we've seen that in about 35% patients, percent of our patients who have a high opening pressure. And um, um, in some patients, in most patients, uh, once we do the lumbar puncture, uh, when we withdraw the fluid, that actually relieves the symptoms. So that's actually one of the things that gives you confidence that probably this might be cryptococcal meningitis. 
So we send the cerebrospinal fluid to the lab, and um, one of the best tests to do will be a cryptococcal antigen test. It's got a very high sensitivity and specificity of about 99 to 100%. Um, you can also perform microscopy with what we call India ink, and the, the sensitivity is a bit lower. It's up to about 60%. And you can also culture uh, and grow the cryptococcus uh, on the fluid. The other parameters in the CSF are not very um, essential to make the diagnosis because they're neither here nor there. The white cell count, the protein, the glucose uh, is not very, um, 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 doesn't really help you to determine the uh, uh, diagnosis. But what you really need is a crag. And if there's no crag, maybe an India ink. And if it's possible, you can have a culture. However, um, Patients might refuse to have a lumbar puncture because there are lots of myths around having a lumbar puncture, and some people do know that it's quite a painful uh, procedure. However, we do do it in a non-painful way by giving a local anesthesia. So if a patient is refusing to have lumbar puncture, it's important to assess their capacity to make decisions and also not to try not to be judgmental and uh, you know, try to provide information as to why it is so important to perform a lumbar puncture and negotiate that they really do need to have the lumbar puncture for us to give them the right treatment. However, sometimes you can have situations where you, the patient still refuses to have a lumbar puncture. And in that situation, if the patient has a positive a serum crack, so that cryptococcal antigen test, you can do it on the cerebrospinal fluid. You can also do it on blood. Okay, to be able to pick up, you know, those asymptomatic antigenemia that I mentioned before as a screening test. And if that is positive and the patient has symptoms and signs of cryptococcal meningitis, you can safely um, treat for meningitis presumptively. Okay. Um, next slide. Yeah. And um, in terms of treatment, uh, the treatment for me uh, crypto meningitis is in three phases. There's an induction phase that lasts two weeks. So that's for you know, rapid clearance of the, uh, the bug from the system. You also have a consolidation phase for eight weeks, which follows that. And then a maintenance phase that's at least 12 months that follows uh, that. And uh, Prof. Rati briefly talked about the updated guidelines. So the, the recommended first line would be the start dose of liposomal phototericin, uh, otherwise known as ambisome, at 10 milligrams per kg as a start dose, okay? And we also give 14 days of flucytosin tablets at 100 milligrams per kg per day. That's divided into four doses, as well as fluconazole, 1,200 milligrams per day, also for 14 days. And then if there is no ambisome, there are other options. So you can give the old IV amphotericin B deoxycholate with flucytosin and fluconazole. And if you have no flucytosin, it's, it's an expensive drug. In other settings, it's difficult to have. If you have no flucytosin, then you can give the same ambisome. But it will not be a start dose this time. It will be a dose for um, 14 days at the lower dose of 3 milligram per kg per day with fluconazole for 14 days. And if you have no amphotericin formulation at all, then you can give the pills, just the flu fluconazole and the flucytosin. And the, um, the mortality benefits as, um, well, uh, as, are still reasonably good. Yeah. Um, sorry, uh, too fast. So the consolidation phase, as I say, this lasts for eight weeks. In this phase, we reduce the dose of fluconazole from 1,200 milligrams to 800 milligrams per day, and that's given for um, eight weeks. And then the maintenance phase, we reduce the dose further to 200 milligrams per day for at least 12 months or at least until you have a CD4 count, which is above 200, and the patient is virally suppressed on the viral load. Um, we have job aids available on how um, you can reconstitute um, ambisome as well as amphotericin. There is a YouTube video link that we're happy to share. Um, this is a, a nurse, an experienced nurse who worked on the ambition trial, who um, sort of like demonstrates how to reconstitute, uh, how to do, um, reconstitute the ambisome and how to give it. And also there is a job aid there uh, on the side. Um, that is a, a chart, really, that helps you to dose. So all you need to do is weigh your patient, and then you look for the weight band of the patient on the first column, and then you tell you how much ambisome you need to give, how many vials, and um, what fl uh, how much fluid to mix it in. Um, 
Prof. Rati mentioned that, you know, amphotericin, ambison and amphotericin B, deoxycholate do have side effects, although ambison side effects are much less. So the side effects would be, you know, renal impairment, hypokalemia, so low potassium, low magnesium, as well as anemia. So to try to, to reduce the risk to develop these side effects, um, before you give the uh, ambisome uh, solution, we give a liter of a fluid called uh, usually normal saline, and that's uh, trying to reduce the risk of developing renal impairment. Okay, and in that fluid we add um, uh, intravenous potassium in that fluid, also to try to reduce the risk for developing um, um, hypokalemia or reduced uh, 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 potassium that can occur when you give this drug. In addition to that, we also give uh, tablets. We give uh, potassium tablets, slow, slow potassium, two, uh, two tablets BD, as well as slow magnesium okay, tablets to, redu to reduce the risk of developing uh, low magnesium, low potassium. And then we give our, after that, we give our amphotericin. And then after that, we give another liter of normal saline to try to reduce the risk of um, renal impairment. Amphotericin is mixed, it should not be uh, reconstituted in um, a fluid containing saline. So normal saline should not be mixed with amphotericin. Um, Ringer's lactate is also not a good idea. So the, the, the fluid that you need to reconstitute that, that ambisome should be dextrose. So typically 5% dextrose, but if there's no 5% dextrose, you can use 10% uh, dextrose. So in a nutshell, if you have a patient and you've done your dosing, you've prescribed, the first thing you do is you give a prehydration liter of normal saline with your potassium chloride in it. Then you flush that IV line with dextrose, okay? And then you give the amphotericin. So we are flushing it to make sure that there is no saline in that line, okay? That can react with your ambisome, okay? And then you give your ambisome for about uh, three hours or so, uh, that liter of ambisome. And then afterwards, you flush it again with dextrose to make sure that you've cleared all the ambisome from the line. Okay, and then you give the post-hydration liter with normal saline. If the patient has uh, other medications that need to be given, then that patient will need two IV cannulas, two lines, okay? And you give all the other medications on one line, and ambisome should be only be given in that other line that is dedicated only for the ambisome. All that to try to reduce um, reactions between saline and ambisome. So ambisome will crystallize, and the crystallization will cause inflammation of the veins called thrombophlebitis, and that's what we're trying to prevent. Fusitocin is a tablet. It's given four times per day. There's also a job aid available that you can uh, use. Um, so same as the ambisome job aid, all you need to do is weigh your patient, and you go on the chart, and it will tell you how much tablets you need to give if, and at what time. Okay, it's also a good drug that you can crush it and give it down a, a nasogastric tube for patients who can't swallow. However, we need to remember that flucytosin can also cause anemia, um, low platelets, and neutrop uh, neutropenia, um, and so we need to do to monitor for that. Mm -hmm. Um, we have job aids available also for uh, self-prescribing and administration of all these drugs and monitoring. So that's a, a, a YouTube video link. Uh, that's Dr. Moyo, one of our experienced crypto doctors from the Ambition Tribe, who explains all this. And then there is a chart on when do you monitor renal function, when do you monitor liver function, when do you monitor your, your, your uh, full blood count. Um, we also have a job aid on how to manage raised intracranial pressure. So most of the symptoms of critical meningitis are because of the raised intracranial pressure. So the patient is producing too much cerebrospinal fluid and that creates pressure in the nervous system. And crypto management is pharmacological and non-pharmacological. So I have talked about the pharmacological part. The non-pharmacological part is uh, where you do what we call therapeutic lumbar punctures. Remember the first lumbar puncture was for diagnosis. You can also do it for therapeutic purposes to relieve the pressure in the nervous system. So this is a job aid that tells you at what opening pressure do you actually uh, re uh, drain the CSF and how much do you drain, and how, how frequently do you do it. I will not go deeply into that, but that, that is available if you need it. Um, immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome um, can occur in HIV, especially if you just, if the patients start um, ART. Sorry for... Uh, yeah, there we are. Um, it, in, so there's also job aid available on when to start ART. What do you do to the ART? 
um, to, you know, to, re to reduce the risk for development of iris, immune regurgitation inflammatory syndrome. So in ART naive patients, uh, we would like to defer uh, initiation of ART for four to six weeks. So give them antifungal uh, treatment for four to six weeks before you start ART. And then in those that are experienced, uh, but they're not adherent or we are uns unsure of their adherence, it is best to stop the ART and defer and, and, and you know, stop the ART for four to six weeks so they can have the antifungal treatment and then you restart the ART. If you think that the patient was failing on the ART, you can go on to second line or third line, depending on what they were on um, before. If a patient has uh, been on ART for more than six months, um, um, just go back. Yep. If the, the patient has been on um, his ART experienced and has been adherent for more than six months, um, we also stop the ART and restart uh, a second line after four to six weeks. Because if they're adherent and have crypto, it means probably that the HIV is now resistant to the ART and they will need second line uh, treatment. So you start second line after four to six weeks. And then so on and so forth. And there are two other um, uh, situations. And then you decide it's just good to have the job aid to know exactly what to do. Um, I'll not talk a lot about uh, iris, but it will usually occur between two weeks and three months. And the patient will develop you know, new symptoms of cryptococcal meningitis. And to differentiate between iris and relapse, you also perform a lumbar puncture. And if you grow the crypto, um, the cryptococcus, uh, if you grow the uh, cryptococcus, then you. Um, it's probably a relapse, but if you don't grow it, I don't know why it's still working now. Yeah. Ah. ah, okay, sorry. If you don't grow the cryptococcus on culture, then it's probably iris, but if you do grow it, then it's probably um, um, a relapse. So that's how you would uh, tell uh, the two apart, yeah. And, um, yeah. yeah, and, yeah, so that's where we were, yeah. Um, yeah. And then, uh, next slide, please. Um, as I said, uh, a relapsed patient will have repeat cryptococcal meningitis symptoms and signs, and if you do grow it, then probably the patient has had a relapse. And a relapse will usually occur in the setting of in that in, inadequate uh, induction uh, of the treatment, or if the patient was not adherent to fluconazole, or if the patient has a bug that is resistant to fluconazole. Okay, and then if that happens, then you restart the treatment. Okay, next slide. Um, so these are the uh, links to the job aids that I talked about, the YouTube videos. Um, we also have an advanced HIV disease toolkit that's available on the App Store, and the global advanced HIV disease uh, toolkit available on that link below. Thank you. Now, um, thank you very much. I'll hand over to Kennedy. So you just bear with us. So we did start about 10 minutes late, so I think we'll run over about 10 minutes at the end. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I've already been introduced. So I wait. I go ahead. Okay. So you, you'll be helping me with um, the next slide, obviously, next slide. Go slide. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yes, yeah, so as you heard, my name is Kennedy Mupele. I'm from Botswana. 
So the, the, the bio has already been read. Um, so in all this, um, the science that you have heard from the previous two speakers, we have the community. You know, this is the, these are the people that benefit from all the science that we've just heard. Um, and that's why in, in all this, uh, this project has a, an active uh, involvement of the community. So, you know, um, when you look at the data, the mortality rate uh, of crypto and NGX is so alarming. And for many years as activists, we have not really paid much attention to crypto. We have done a lot of work around TB. We've done, we are doing a lot of work with, with, around you know, uh, 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 vaccine work. We're doing a lot of work around HIV cure itself, but we are not doing a lot of work as, as communities around crypto meningitis. So the, the death rate is quite alarming. Over 110,000 uh, reported deaths every year is quite alarming. And as I, at one point as an activist, I felt ashamed because over the years, we have not actively been actively involved in, in, in putting, demanding for, for interventions to address advanced HIV disease. So next slide, please. So, yes, so I think from the previous speaker, um, from the chair, you've heard of the word, the acronym called IMPRINT. So IMPRINT stands for International Mycosis Prevention, Research, Implementation Networks, and Training. So it's, it's a Fungal HIV Global Health Research Group. Next one. It's, co it's being co-led by Joe and, and Nelish. I can't even see. Sorry, guys, I can't see. So, yeah, so our impact as, um, as advocacy, uh, our advocacy impact uh, of the imprint community advisory board is that we are trying to advocate for the expansion of access to antifungal treatments. So we want to advocate, we're advocating actually, we're already advocating for the use of treatment from the ACTA and ambition trial. We are also, want to push for, for access uh, to, to CREG test, cryptococcal antigen tests. We are also want countries that are not implementing the WHO guidelines to begin to do that. We are also looking at HG packages to be included in our national treatment guidelines. Also want to provide variable you know, uh, insights across the project. As, as affected communities. We also want to enhance uh, 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 patient literacy because we know that this also is, uh, forms a cornerstone of, of improving patient outcomes. Patients need to be really, really educated on what cryptococcal meningitis is. They have to know their signs and symptoms. They, ha they have to know that, you know, disengaging from care puts them at risk of developing cryptococcal meningi meningitis. So we also look at the ethical uh, 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 communication practices. We want to, our job is to, to, to advise on how the project can begin to use or how the project is using, you know, lived experiences of affected communities. Next slide. So that's a brief uh, uh, background or brief description of the imprint. We have the community engagement uh, uh, that I'm, I'm chairing. I'm leading, then we have a, a implementation team like the share CM, we have the prevention uh, uh, team, we have the health economics team, we have the diagnostics team, and we have the training team. Next slide. So yeah, so Imprint Cub comprised of members from Botswana, South Africa, Mozambique, DRC, Congo, uh, Guinea, Vietnam, and Malawi. So what is there? There's really, there's an urgency here. Um, we need to advocate as communities for an expanded access to antifungal treatment globally. So the uh, liposome and fortalicin B uh, needs to be accessible to all countries globally. Then we need also to push for the expansion uh, for 
for survival rates. You know, uh, we need survival rates uh, when people are taking this, uh, an these antifungals. We need to see the results. We need people to have better health outcomes. Next slide. So you can see on these slides that uh, uh, the, the availability of prep testing is, is, we are not doing fine, as, as, as a, especially as a continent. Um, some countries, we don't even have data. Uh, where there's data is scanty. Um, and even where there is, is available, um, we did some survey with my group, uh, uh, the advisory committee board, the committee advisory board. We also found out that in some facilities, it's not really accessible, despite being in the guidelines. So we need to continue to educate our, our communities because when such services are not available, if we empower our communities, they will begin to demand for them. Next slide. So as I said earlier on, we are the voices of this project. We have people that have shared their lived experiences. Uh, some of us have gone, if you talk of HD, is something that in some previous years it was, I used to call it as an annual event. So we know how we pass through this. So we know how, what it is to pass through, you know, advanced HIV disease. So our strategy focuses on integrating new antifungal regimens into national guidelines. Because if it's just, you know, in some countries where we are, we find that some, some hospitals are providing the, the new WHO, um, implement the new WHO guidelines. However, the country at large does, they, they, they have no um, capacity or they have the country that have not updated their national guidelines to include the new WHO guidelines. 